Hello, everybody. Greetings from the lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Utes people here in Colorado. And I bid welcome to you all sitting on the lands of the Lukongan speaking peoples uh, and the, the Coast Salish, Esquimalt, and Saanich peoples who uh, occupy those, those traditional lands. My name is David Atkinson. And welcome to Geography 373, Applied Climatology. Um, as you can see, I am not uh, currently in Victoria. I'm, I'm down here in Denver, Colorado. What am I doing here? I'm at uh, the general meeting of the American Meteorological Society. Here's my little tag, just to prove it. Um, and I'm here giving two talks, actually. So one of them I gave this morning, and I will show you. It was this one, where we talk about um, projects that have engaged northern communities, uh, western Alaska, but uh, but more recently in the western Canadian Arctic, in the vicinity of the uh, Mackenzie Delta. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those during the class, like in, in several weeks from now, but but this is a project where we've we've worked with communities and worked with the Meteorological Service of Canada, the Forecast Center in Edmonton, and the Canadian Ice Service, who are provide federal forecasting services to try to to get those two groups to to work together a little bit better and to to share and communicate, uh, so forecasting is more effective. Um, Excuse me. And the other talk, which I have to do tomorrow, is an entirely different thing, talking about uh, what's called the planetary boundary layer, uh, near very close to the surface in, in Fairbanks, actually, in several locations in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's part of a large project led by uh, Javier Focasato, who's uh, a colleague and a good friend of mine, in Fairbanks. Uh, the Fairbanks link comes because I uh, I used to work at Fairbanks. I was a professor in the atmosphere science department up there until 2010. And that's when I came to, to Victoria. Um, so before we get into things, um, just uh, I guess a little bit of background about myself. Um, I started out, uh, I, I'm, I like applied climatology. Um, it's really where my heart lies. Uh, this this course, this is my course. I designed it when I came here, and this is, I've always been the only one to teach it. Um, and it, it very much reflects the sort of things that I, I like to do. Um, I started out uh, flying airplanes before I went to university, and then I went to university and I started in physics, and then kind of wanted to get outside a little more. And so I switched to physical geography. And then I did a, a master's in remote sensing up in the Arctic, in the high Arctic. Um, and then I did PhD work in climate in the Arctic as well. Um, ever Really ever since I got quite interested in the Arctic in my bachelor's, I took a couple of courses. And uh, so my first field season was what, 1990 in a uh, what's called a Logan tent for four months in the center of Ellesmere Island. Um, and I've always been, uh, you know, my regional specialty is, is the Arctic um, and, um, and cryological features in Alpine area. So I also work on, on glaciers. I've worked on uh, Columbia ice field and Nahani. So we'll go to go out and, and set up field camps either on the glaciers or, or nearby. And then we'll set up big weather towers on the glaciers and, and so on. Um, when I was at Fairbanks, I did a little bit of work, uh, sort of Pacific Basin wide. I worked with um, uh, the Pacific Services Center in Honolulu for for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, mostly mostly Arctic. You know, then a little bit in in BC. There's a weather station we have in the Okanagan Valley, and and this sort of thing. But um, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of work um, on on things like like the planetary boundary layer. Um, Fairbanks is a very interesting place. A lot of places in the north are very interesting because the surface energy balance uh, can become very negative. And um, your class tomorrow, I, I won't be here, but one of my grad students, uh, Vida Kalilian, 
will be taking the class and she'll be talking about that surface energy balance and uh, radiation balance and so on. So, okay. So uh, let's go back here. So yeah, I just today wanted to just talk a little bit about the outline um, and make a, a few comments about the lab and then provide what's called a concept map for the course. And then just kind of a, a, a quick tour of some some things to think about in the, the applied climatology realm. Um, you know, I'm not going to read through the outline. You'll see it posted on, on Brightspace and you can read through it. But the TA for the course, uh, we have two lab sections and the TA for both of them is Osamu Kabayama. Um, he's a very experienced programmer, so you'll be in, in very good hands. The lab in the labs, you learn Python programming language, and you don't so much. Um, we show you because I'll be in the labs as well in many cases, um, and we do some pretty fancy things in the sense of of analyzing different types of data like stream flow data, and you know different types of climate data and so on. And it's, you know, I know most of you will be very new to Python. Um, and maybe some of you have seen R like in 226 or something like that. And that's all fine. You know, none of that's wasted. Um, and but, so, yeah, I, I don't really expect anyone to know Python. Um, but at the same time, to do good, you know, to do really interesting things, the, the program should be a little more sophisticated in a sense. So... So what we do is, is we build the programs in the lab and show you how things work, but then you will be handed the, the completed programs. You know enough about the language at that point to manipulate the programs, just to change some of the variables, like change the month to make different plots for different months and that sort of thing. But, but you don't have to create the whole program yourself because that would be too much for this level. But instead you're using the program, you're using it as a tool which is really, you know, that's the intent. We're not in computer science or software engineering. You know, we're in, in physical geography and we're, we want to use programming as a means to an end. We're performing an analysis that's going to serve some other purpose. And so that's that's how we've got the lab set up. No labs this week, um, that's pretty typical. We're going to, I used to use something called Anaconda. I use Anaconda and Spider personally as a, as a programming development interface. Um, I know a lot about programming. I've used a lot of different programming languages all the way back to like an Apple II Plus I had when in 1981 <laughs> when I was in high school and I learned Fortran on punch cards and so on. Um, and I've used a lot of different computer systems. So, um, uh, and so, uh, the, the system, yeah, the system I like to use is this thing called Anaconda as, as a framework, and then the programming interface is, is Spider. Um, Anaconda is kind of, kind of a beast to install. I mean, it installs okay, but it's a huge program, and it's sort of easy to break. Um, so we've actually, what we're going to do, and, and not everybody has a, a computer that can that can handle it, um, like some people have Chromebooks and stuff like that. So, and we can install Anaconda on a Chromebook. So, uh, and Osamu, actually, your TA introduced me to this. It's something called Google Collaboratory. And uh, yeah, you can program online and then save stuff locally. And it seems to work really well. So we started using it for another class I have called, uh, I also teach a graduate course. Um, geography 524 advanced quantitative methods and there we've started using Col google colab as well and it's it's been great um yeah so um let's see so that's the labs we've got our two lab sections um on wednesday and thursday i believe um Let's see here. We do have a text called uh, Correga, or the author is, is Correga, um, Geographical Information and Climatology. 
So pretty, pretty uh, apropos, I guess. Um, and hopefully the it was ordered. Um, if not, don't worry about it. We can, we'll figure something out. Um, but yeah, go check the bookstore because we we do a fair number. We take a fair number of readings from that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you really do need to come to the labs. The labs will all be two. We have five labs and they're two weeks each. So you've got plenty of time. Do not leave the labs until the last minute. Um, because, you know, the, the TA, like Osamu, isn't sort of on standby 24 hours. You know, we, we provide most of it in the first session. And then the second session is kind of, you can work on it and, and get in-class help. Um, but you really do have to, to dive into it. It's not something that you want to leave to the last minute, um, especially, you know, when you're new to programming. Yeah, um, uh, you have to prepare for the unexpected. So definitely don't leave it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of tutorial material on Python. And, it, it, you know, I really strongly urge you to <clears throat> to use this as a bit of a springboard into Python. I mean, for anyone thinking at all about, uh, a, you know, future work that might involve data analysis, you know, you need to have your own toolbox. And, um, I mean, we'll get into this a little more. You know, some people say, no, no, you should use R, R is better and Python's better and whatever. And no, I use C plus and, you know, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. The most popular programming language now is Python. That just happened last year. It kind of reached. And that means most popular means almost 17%. Now, I don't know who they surveyed, you know, how big or what types of people. But anyhow, of the people surveyed, 17% use Python. And then the next two most popular languages are C plus and C. Um, so C, the C family is a very popular programming language. You know, R is is comes a fair bit down. R tends to be very good at specific things, like really statistics. It's it's quite good at. Python is a little less, is a tiny bit rougher around the edges on 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 stats. You know, you have to do a tiny bit more work. You do the same stuff that you can do in, in R. But Python is is a more of a general programming system. So you can build a solution to just about any type of problem you need. That's a little harder with, with R. Python is also a, the programming language that you'll find in, in the background of, of ARC, like um, ArcGIS. Um, Python is also used for, for web programming. You know, so it's 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 a pretty good language all around. There are tons and tons of modules. There's actually more than a hundred thousand modules, libraries out there of specialized programming um, pieces for for different types of tasks. For example, there are a couple that do the very specialized plots for meteorology, like um, vertical temperature profile plots and and stuff like that. Anyhow. So probably enough about that. We'll yeah, we'll talk lots more about Python and the labs and so on. Um, but yeah, check out um, um, check out the tutorial material that you'll find online. There's tons of it. So yeah, so use this opportunity to really to to jump into a programming system. Sorry, I'm looking at the the outline here beside me. Um, the labs will be due before you start the next one, just, just so we don't have people in the in the new lab um, working on, you know, on last week's lab, that sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Yes, we'll be on Brightspace, of course. Um, there are some other readings in the physical section, which I'll, I've posted from a, a, a general textbook on weather and climate processes by Aguado and Bert, which is one of like there are about five of these classic textbooks. I mean, this is stuff that you've learned in 272. And so I'll I'll talk about the course structure here in just a minute. But but things like, you know, Vita will talk about radiation. Well, there's only one class and she's going to go through it fairly quickly. Um, and then we'll kind of go tripping through processes fairly quickly because you should have seen them already in previous classes like 103 and 272. So, and I'm making that assumption. Um, Let's see. 
tests and exams. So there are two midterms. There is a midterm that follows each major uh, module. So we have three modules. Like I say, I'll talk about it in more detail, but we've got a process module. Then there's a midterm. There is a um, kind of a data and information module. Then there's a midterm. And then the last major part of the course is all the different applications. And then there's a final. And the final is in the regular final exam period. And it's a written final. Um, the none of the exams are cumulative in that the the first midterm is only on the first section second midterm only on the second section the final is only on the the applied stuff so once we're done with processes and you've done the the midterm that's it you won't see it again so um there will be maybe a couple of questions kind of drawn from the labs on the final as well um so the waiting the two midterms are 15% each. The final is 30%, which is the minimum. We can make a final. I don't like big, heavy weighted finals. And um, the labs are 40%. So 8% each for each lab. They're all equal. So yeah, I'm pretty straightforward breakdown. Um, let's see. Okay, right. So yeah, okay. So let's turn to the concept map of the course. One sec. Oh, I went right past it. Too much stuff over there. Way too much stuff over there. Okay. All right. So a, a concept map is just a um, a general overview of a course. Um, so talk about here. So like I mentioned, the course is, is structured into these three major modules, processes, information, and applications. The first module, the processes module, basically we need to understand, if we're going to talk about climate, we need to, to have a physical understanding of, of how the processes that drive the climate operate. That seems to make sense. Right, like if we're going to talk about, say, um, coastal cooling due to proximity to the water, you know, we want to probably understand about sea breezes, things like that. So uh, the subsections within the process module, radiation. Okay, so why do we care about radiation? Well, care about uh, surface heating and cooling, surface radiation balance, and again, like I say, Vita is going to be talking all about this. You know, we recognize the two main types, solar and terrestrial, like short wave and long wave. Um, and for sol solar, you know, we think about total potential sunlight. You know, like if you're going to operate a farm, you want to know how much sunlight you're getting in a, in a certain area. Um, albedo of a surface, that's how reflective it is. Um, and all of these things, of course, are affected by, you know, latitude, season, slope, ground cover, clouds so on. Like I say, Vita will take you all through that tomorrow. Pressure. Next, we'll talk about pressure. Why do we care about atmospheric pressure? Well, that's where winds come from. Pressure differences equal pressure gradients. Air moves along a pressure gradient. Air simply tries to go from high to low, right? It tries to even out those imbalances. And because we're standing still, we feel the air moving past us as wind. And we recognize, you know, large scale patterns, like synoptic scale, scales of hundreds and thousands of kilometers, like, uh, like you see on a weather map. Uh, we talk about the gradient. That's that's how rapidly the change of pressure is that uh, that influences how strong the wind's going to be. Uh, or, you know, its speed, and then how the gradient is oriented, that'll affect the wind direction. So like I say, we'll talk about that. Large-scale synoptics, we're going to review that sort of stuff, um, including uh, weather organizations such as storm systems, you know, and why do we care about that? Well, you know, clouds and frontal passages and precip and winds and advection. Advection is the horizontal movement of air possessed of various particular qualities of 
heat uh, and moisture content and this sort of thing. So like we feel that in, in, in the Southern Vancouver Island region, uh, when we get airflow from the Southwest, well, it'll be 10 degrees in, in January, you know, and that's, we're getting warm air from, from quite far South advected over us. Uh, local scale modifications. So that's, we've got large scale, then local scale, you know, like interaction with topography. And we know that that slopes, if you have a north facing slope and a south facing slope, well, they get, they have very different radiation regimes. You know, and I think this is, everybody kind of knows this intuitively, but then we have other phenomena like upslope fog, um, orographic precipitation, down valley drainage, like density drainage of cold air down a valley, um, wind modification along coastal, you know, coastal areas. So lots of stuff to talk about there. But again, all these things feed back into, you know, you always think about linking it to the applications. So if someone is going to build a structure, well, you kind of want to have an idea of what the precip is going to be. So you can think about the roof type, what the wind is going to be. So you can maybe think about how to orient the structure. If it's within a city, you know, you don't want to set something up that's going to like create a bunch of wind tunnels that make it unpleasant for people to, to walk around in you know, all sorts of things. So you need to understand the general climatic context before you dive into various types of applications. Okay, so the next module I call information. And basically, if, if we're going to analyze weather, you know, and climate, how do we do that? Well, we have to gather a bunch of data. So we have to understand data, we have to understand analysis processes. You know, where does this data come from? How do we gather weather and climate data globally? All that kind of thing. And then how do we analyze it? And then models, we'll talk about models. Um, so the first part will be data gathering. Like how do we go out and get data? Well, you know, we need, why do we do it? Well, we need to acquire like, what's the temperature? What's the wind speed? Very basic questions, but it's not a trivial process. If you think about, the, the weather enterprise globally, and we'll talk about that. It's it's quite a quite a deal. People take it completely for granted, right? You've got your iPhone or your cell phone and little suns and clouds appear. There's a weather forecast. And where did it come from? Who knows? How is it generated? Who knows? We'll talk about that because mm -hmm. it's quite a process. And, you know, the Canadian federal government spends a lot of money to do it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's useful to, to know about this. Yeah, instruments here, you know, telemetry, QCQA, quality control, quality and um, analysis, uh, archiving. What do you do with all the data that you've gathered? And then how do you serve it up? You go online, oh, I'm going to download data from 1960 from Prince George. Okay, well, somebody has to maintain that database and maintain it in such a way that you can access it. It's not just a file, an Excel file stuck in your computer. You can't access that on the web, you know, so things like this. It's quite a process. Analysis. How do we analyze data? Well, we're going to be doing that in the labs, but, you know, if you've got, <clears throat> so just think, hourly data, weather data is usually recorded hourly. So if you have 50 years of hourly data, that's half a million observations. Um, okay, yeah, you, you can... You can wedge all that into an Excel spreadsheet. Nowadays, you couldn't in the past. Now you can, sure. But but you have to sift through all this stuff. You don't really want to look at every data point. You want to be able to reduce it. You want to summarize it. So you'll say, well, you know, all right, all this data. What's the average temperature? What's the average January temperature? That's kind of what I want to know. Okay, that's the average temperature. How variable is it? You know, does it really swing a lot or does it, if it's the average is eight degrees, is it like eight degrees plus or minus one degree? Or is it eight degrees plus or minus 10 degrees? You know, that sort of thing. Is there a lot of variability? What's the average wind speed? What's the time series? Is there a trend? You know, like, hello, climate change. Is there a trend in the time series of temperature? Well, we, we start to do all these sorts of analyses. You know, and there we've got, whoops, basic statistical, you know, like means and totals. 
um, more advanced statistical, such as threshold exceedance, you know, and that now gets into planning purposes or engineering purposes. How often do we get more than 50 millimeters of rainfall in a two hour period? Well, if you're building a storm drain system, you need to know that. Um, let me move my little thing. Um, right, extremes, you know, that gets into the discussion of extremes, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, the spatial context. So that was just Victoria. What if you now have 50 years of data from, from 20 weather stations throughout the lower mainland? That's getting much more complicated. And that's where we quickly step out of a realm like Excel and into something like Python. We start to need that real analytical power that uh, then a more sophisticated programming system can bring. Concepts of station representativeness. If you've got a station wedged down into a valley versus like a station out in the middle of the prairie, which one is going to be better representative of a, of a broader area? You know, that sort of thing. Modeling. So we're, we're gonna talk about modeling. Um, why? Because the, the term modeling is used a great deal you, in a lot of different contexts. And it's hard to figure out what people mean by by modeling. So just just to start off, uh, for the time being, we've really got three different major types of models that we're going to talk about: empirical statistical models, and these are derived from the data. Uh, we'll talk about those. I mean, I I did one of these for my PhD as part of my PhD some years ago. Um, We've got fluid dynamical models, and these will be models like um, uh, numerical weather systems, like the, the forecast model that uh, Met Service of Canada runs in Dorval, at their facility in Dorval, is a fluid dynamics-based model. Um, it's, it's what's called the first principles model. And yeah, like I say, we'll talk more about it. And then we've got things like topoclimatic or distributed modeling systems as well. Um, and these kind of integrate physical processes and statistical analyses together. Um, but yeah, this this will just help you kind of get a handle on, on models. Okay, applications. Now the applications, um, we won't, um, uh, I'll list them in, in the outline. We won't necessarily follow that particular order, but yeah, we've we've just we're going to hit on a bunch of different uh, major topics. Um, urban, talk about climatology in the urban setting, and I mean everyone's heard about urban heat islands and stuff like that. That's a that's a huge topic. Uh, agriculture, it's another kind of obvious one. Transportation, you know who is who is caught up or who is affected in some way by the snow. Uh, just before Christmas, you know, it's like everybody, right? In one way or another. I wasn't traveling, but my daughter had a flight on the 20th. Well, that was that, you know, trying to go east. So, uh, you know, around here, yeah, <laughs> we kind of get that one. Um, but there are a lot of lot of different issues, you know, snow falling on the airport and shutting it down is one thing. But we've got some more subtle ones like roadway freezing, you know, the consideration of minimum temperature. And that's where we pull back into the physical process of, of uh, cold air drainage. We get cold air drainage into a valley. Where are the roads? In the valleys. And so for just a short period of time, often like between 4 a.m. and, and 6.30 a.m., the roadway will freeze. You'll end up with black ice on it. Um, cars will, you know, completely lose control. And then by about 7 a.m., gone it's melted you know no problem type of thing but it's so it's it's very short-lived you know it's it's a tricky one and it's it's an important one for bc uh, hydrology so um climate intersection with uh, with water and we've got lots of different considerations for that that we'll look at climatology and fire <laughs> there's kind of no end to it here the same daughter is uh, a firefighter with the provincial ministry. Um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. Um, and then we've also, uh, since I made this thing, I've introduced, uh, we've, we've, we're have we going to have a guest lecture come in, um, Daniel from the library. He's got an interesting talk about 
um, the dispersion of little plastic beads from the lower mainland and the climatological impact of their dispersion. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, and then I've also de developed a new module on, I mean, really, this is what I work on, like, like you saw from the, um, the first uh, presentation that I gave here today, is, is weather and climate and the intersection of, of northern indigenous activities. Um, and and how um, indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge really can be merged to create solutions. Uh, we have a paper out on this. People keep at the conference today. People are saying, "Yeah, no, we really need to do this." And I was thinking, we've we've already done it. I have a paper who, with indigenous co-authors on it as as knowledge holders, you know, of, of equal rank or whatever uh to you know to me or anybody else you know we all bring different pieces together to form you know a greater whole so we'll, we'll talk about that as well okay how are we doing i got 20 minutes left so so that's kind of the structure of the course and now i wanted to go through go back to this and just kind of talk about we're not going to use jupiter just talk about a few more applications. I mean, we've kind of talked about some things. You know, here's a good one from, from agriculture, uh, ginseng, uh, Southern Ontario. Ginseng is actually um, native to Canada, which I had never thought, but you can see they're discovered in Canada 1716. So um, I thought it was an import, but whatever. Um, in southern Ontario, and I don't know who's from Ontario. Normally, I say put up your hands, but I can't see you because uh, this is not asynchronous. Um, southern Ontario, back you know in the day, they kind of got a lot of sandy soils, and it's great for growing tobacco. And there are a lot of, excuse me, tobacco farms in southern Ontario. Well, that's kind of you know fallen a little out of vogue sort of thing. So the farmers are saying, well, what, what can we grow instead of tobacco? And ginseng you can grow with microclimate modification. So it requires a specific microclimate. And if you introduce like a certain type of, of uh, shading to the fields, you're able to grow ginseng. So so some tobacco farmers have switched over to, to growing ginseng instead with um, with an understanding of the uh, microclimate modification they need to make. All right, not going to worry about that. Like we said, you know, uh, transportation, BC mountain, winter weather, you know, and, and not just for roads, but for aircraft travel. I mean, you know, what, what happened uh, last November, or not last, but November of 2021 with that atmospheric river, we had Victoria or Vancouver completely cut off the road transportation from the mainland, you know, so it's, it's not even just winter weather, it's severe rainfall as well. Um, <clears throat> right. I mean, the usual thing, you know, we can, we, <laughs> you know, I've got some stuff from past years, but uh, you know, we, we can just pull this up at any point, you know, it's kind of funny The I, used to teach uh, another class, 484, Shannon Fargy teaches it now, and I'll be helping her a little bit. Um, but I I wouldn't even prepare case studies because each year there's some crazy thing that goes on with the weather that we can talk about in real time. So, uh, and of course, it's not just, just Canada, you know, it's all sorts of different countries. Uh, you know, I found this one interesting. Here is, you know, you don't hear this very, you know, Turkey having the big snowstorm but you know we're, we're starting to get this a little more often now um with climate change climate change of course means um it's it's not just that everything's getting warmer all over the place it's it's really things are becoming more variable you know not even so much more extreme but but more variable and we'll talk a little bit about the reason for that, although it's not really a climate change course, but um, but physically the jet stream is becoming kind of wavier. And the reason for that is 
the temperature gradient between the north and the south is weakening. And with a weaker temperature gradient, we have a weaker jet stream. A weaker jet stream is able to move, is to able, able to wiggle around more. And so we'll get things like the snow that we got the other week. You know, So there before Christmas, at one point, we had a quarter of a billion people in North America under a severe weather advisory. Just about all parts of Canada, like I'll uh, I'll show you later on the warning map. Just every just about every forecast zone in the country was red, from some sort of warning, and the same thing for the states. Like two thirds of the country was under some severe warning. Why? Because the jet stream was was zipping way up into Alaska and then diving straight down the west coast. So we were, we were cold. Everywhere in the central U.S. was cold and was also generating a great big storm out east. We got our storm. So, so yeah, and and this this has brings sometimes unusual weather to places that might not have seen it, you know, per se before. Yeah, same sort of thing. The severe weather came as a surprise to many citizens, especially those living in the city of uh, Antalya, whoops, which saw its first snowfall in more than two decades. So, um, And actually, we saw what happened on in Buffalo on the east side of Lake, Lake Ontario. And again, I would ask people if, do you know why that happened? Well, that's that's called lake effect snow, but it was particularly severe. And we can talk about the mechanism for that. But a place like Buffalo will get tons and tons of snow. And you just go north just a little bit to Kingston, and they, you know, they won't get hardly any. And so we, we can talk about why, why that is. But yeah, it can be quite a mess. Um yeah, we'll talk talk a bit about the north as well. Um, the issue of of tundra travel, um, you know, and there's a bulldozer pulling a bunch of you know supply boxes for for oil or for a diamond mine or something like that. Um, and they're they're doing it in the winter because they're not allowed to do it in the summer because the tundra is too soft, and in the north one passage of a heavy vehicle is enough to permanently damage the tundra. It, it commences a cycle of degradation of the permafrost underneath that changes the thermal structure um, and, and commences a cycle of degradation of the permafrost that's, that's irreversible. And so in Northern Canada and North Slope of Alaska, they say you can only do this kind of thing in the wintertime when it's frozen and when we have a certain level of snow. And so there's that's a big climatological implication because all the companies are waiting around for there to be enough snow and then the like the Alaska state government says okay go you know and then they're off they go but every day they're waiting to start their operations that you know cost some hundreds of thousands of dollars because people are sitting around doing nothing you know so yeah no it's it's a big deal we'll talk about that um subsistence so here are you know northern um uh, harvesters uh, are heavily affected by fog. And actually, Vida, uh, she did a master's here, and her focus was on fog and low visibility in the Arctic, in the Western Arctic. That's exactly what she worked on. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, I mean, no matter how well you know the land, if it's really foggy, you really can't go out. It's, it's simply not safe. Um, so yeah, fog's kind of a, you know, we think about a, a big powerful storm as being a disruptor, but fog is this silent, quiet, creeping thing which can shut everything down. Shipping, large scale and small scale, uh, aircraft operations. It's not safe to drive, like you probably heard about the pileup near Calgary the other day, a patch of really dense fog and people kind of just go flying into it. So, so fog's a bad one. Uh, this concept of inversion. So this is, um, this is Fairbanks, actually, uh, and this is a picture taken from uh, my office. <laughs> the, the university kind of sits up on the hill and sort of lords over the town, um, and the town is is in what's called the town on a valley, and in the distance are the Alaska mountains of the Alaska Range, and if we keep going 
sort of to the to the right on the picture, you you could just see um, Mount McKinley, Denali, in the distance. Um, but this is what it looks like under a severe inversion condition. And this, an inversion is when the surface is cooling so intensely that it's much colder than the air above it. And so on a day like today, the surface, like the airport, which is kind of hidden in, in the haze down there, is probably reading minus 45. And up where I am, up, up on the, the ridge, west ridge above the town, it's it's it'll be at least 20 degrees warmer and uh with with such a strong inversion the air is very stable it doesn't want to rise and you have severe pollution issues um inside the inversion light you can see how kind of smoky and hazy it is in there and then above it beautifully clear and and this is a big issue for for places in the north places in valleys throughout bc where, the, where again you get cold air drainage, you get a strong inversion, and then you you don't get pollutants dissipating. They get trapped under that inversion layer. So actually, in the states, in the winter time, cities with bad air quality, it's it's um, you know Los Angeles, Denver, actually where I am right now, and then Fairbanks, you know. So it's one of the worst cities in the winter time because of this phenomenon. So here's another interesting um, uh, anecdote. This is the John Hancock building. And I think it's, I don't know if it still is, but at one point it was the tallest building in in New England area, you know, outside of New York sort of thing. And it's a nice big building and, you know, lots of glass and all this kind of thing. When it was first built, it looked like this. So the windows started popping out. I mean, you can see the plywood that they've stuck in. I mean, these are big windows, you know, and the glass will be really thick. You can imagine like what that would be like down below. Um, why did that happen? Well, the building was swaying. The building was swaying and kind of flexing and was actually flexing enough to like pop the windows right out of the frame. Why was that happening? They didn't analyze the wind climatology. So they put the building up. They didn't have a good sense of what the winds, you know, how how often they were a certain speed from a certain direction at a certain height up where the building's going to be. And the wind was just the right direction at the right speed, often enough that it would buffet the building and it would just cause the thing to sway. The building wasn't rigid enough. It wasn't oriented in the right way whatever, you know, engineering consideration you need to have. But yeah, not a proper wind climatology and the building was not designed appropriately and they had a lot of very expensive problems. You can imagine the lawsuits, right? The pane of glass coming down on your car, hopefully with you not in it, but it would, you know, it would destroy your car and so on, you know, and, and then people were, were actually getting motion sick in the upper floors, couldn't work in the building. So a big mess. So, yeah, you got to think about the climatic context before you start building stuff. So what else do we think about? We'll talk about this as well in the urban context. Human comfort, uh, urban microclimates. So like I mentioned earlier, you don't want to put in a building and then create a bunch of, of wind tunnels where the wind goes ripping along and it's kind of unpleasant to walk. There's dirt and it's, you know, cold and stuff. So you got to think about that. But then other issues, and you've probably, you know, we've all heard of wind chill and Humidex. Um, Humidex is actually um, uh, developed in by the Canadian Met Service. Um, but both of these combine things like, um, well, in the case of, of Humidex, temperature and moisture content of the air. And we'll talk about why, um, like why, why is it that when we get more moisture in the air, it feels less comfortable? You know, you can think about that. We'll talk about that later on. Same thing with wind chill. In, the, in this case, it's not moisture, but it's temperature with wind speed. So again, what's the physical mechanism of wind causing a problem? So what's the physical mechanism of 
moisture in the air causing a problem for humans when the temperature is high? And what's the physical mechanism for wind causing a problem for people when temperatures are low? So you can think about those things as well. And I think that's just about it. And I think we're out of time. Oh, look, you got seven minutes to spare. So we'll stop it there. And um, yes, you'll see Vida on on Wednesday. And I'm coming back on Thursday night. So assuming there's no giant snowstorm that shuts down the airport, I'll see you on, on Friday. And I'm going to stop the share. Actually, I don't need to. I'll just stop recording. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, we'll see you uh, later on. And welcome to the class.